Yuri Galvan is uh, working in uh, the Astroparticle and Cosmology Laboratory in Paris. Um, he is involved in, in the international project called uh, LISA, uh, which is a uh, project um, that uh, aims to send a uh, gravitational wave detector in space. Uh, Hubert is a professor assistant, assistant in Paris Dido University, is a deputy head of the gravitation team in, uh, in his lab. Uh, his team mainly works on, uh, on, on gravitational waves. And uh, he is an advisor physicist for on um, research and development activities for the, the LISA mission. Um, so we are very pleased to have him, having him today. Uh, you there? You can. You? you can. Okay. So share the, my screen. You can share your screen okay. and, and start. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for the introduction. Uh, so yes, I will talk um, for the next uh, minutes about uh, LISA. So LISA is, stands for Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. And this is a project for detecting gravitational waves from space, so with million kilometer interferometry, but in space. Um, so basically I will talk about uh, a bit about optics, but not op in, uh, of space optics, but not space optics for imaging, but for interferometry. So we, we, problem is our slide, our quite different, actually. Okay, so uh, let's start. Okay, I will first uh, make a short introduction to gravitational waves. What do what are they, and um, and what do we? I mean, what do we try to to detect? So, of course, gravitational waves well starts from gravitation, and gravitation is of course from Newton and just. To remind you, you probably all know uh, about that, that uh, uh, basically when you talk about Newton, Newton's law of gravitation, you have a relationship between the um, spatial fluctuation of the potential here and the mass distribution. But if you look at it uh, in more details, there is no mention about time or anything. So which means that the force, I mean, the gravitational force is instantaneous and even at the time of Newton, it was disturbing. Well, however, Newton, uh, Newton gravitation, I mean, the Newton, uh, the law of gravitation from Newton are precise enough to perform a lot, a lot of computation. But if you want to go one step further, then you need to go to general relativity. So basically, 100 years ago, uh, Einstein reinterpreted the gravitations as a Ge uh, the deformation of space-time, of the geometry of space-time. So basically what it means is that you have on the right the energy distribution, and we know that um, mass is a kind of energy, and the energy distribution in space will force the uh, space-time, the metric of space-time to curve, and in which case it will affect the, the movement of, m of masses uh in uh, in space so which means basically that mass um tells the space the space time how to curve and this and the space time tells the matter how to move so which means that we have deformation of space time due to matter basically if you imagine that uh, the mass is moving somehow in this in this field then it will cause uh waves of uh, curvature of the space-time, that you will have the deformation of space-time that we propagate uh, in space, and this propagation is actually what we call the uh, gravitational, so this, this gravitational waves, so that's uh, basically the propagation of gravitational information uh, through space for some objects. Um, well, if you, we look a little bit into what are the gravitational waves in more details? Well, gravitational waves are elastic deformations of space-time metric, which means that if you put uh, on space-time initial uh, masses, so just at rest on the space-time metric, and there, if there is a gravitational wave going through the screen that you see perpendicularly to the screen, 
then the different uh, so the different test masses that you might have put on, on this uh, on the metric of the space time will oscillate and will oscillate with two different uh, movement one which is called the cross polarization the other one is the plus polarization so it's basically the same idea as for electromagnetic waves but we are talking here about uh, quadrupole waves and not uh, and, and not Okay, so quadrupole, transverse quadrupole waves. And basically, the observational effect that we will uh, try to detect on ground is a, is a variation of, uh, of the light uh, distance between two masses. So that is what is illustrated on the lower, I mean, on the right here. That is, if you consider three test masses, and you measure with a laser, for example, measuring the time of flight between these two test masses. If, the, if you have a gravitational wave going through, I mean, perpendicularly and going through the, through the, the screen, then you will have um, one arm extending while the other one is shrinking. And you will have a small change of delta L, so of the distance, uh, that will be proportional to the distance between the test masses. So basically the deformation, re relative deformation called delta L over L is basically the gravitational wave amplitude with a factor two that is not really relevant here, but you will have H will be, which will be the amplitude of the elastic deformation of space time. And then this is the gravitational wave amplitude. For gravitational waves we are trying to detect uh, from ground or from space, we are talking about H values at the, at the level of 10 to minus 21, which means that basically over 1 million kilometer, you expect a change of about one picometer. So that's the level of, the, of precision of accuracy that you need to, to achieve. Um, some words about uh, what kind of sources uh, can uh, emit gravitational waves. Well, first here, what I can say is uh, you to have a uh, gravitational wave, you need to have a non-spherical acceleration of massive objects, which means basically that an isolated, perfectly spherical uh, body, even, even in rotation, will not produce any gravitational wave. How, uh, on the contrary, if you have a binary system, the, uh, an asymmetric explosion of star, a uh, core collapse of, uh, of a star, an asymmetric core collapse uh, for a star, or if you have a, a neutron star uh, spinning but with a small mountain of a few microns or a few tens of microns on its surface, it, will, it might be enough to produce gravitational waves that might be detectable, of course, depending on the distance of the source. So basically, for Lisa, what we will hunt is um, our binary systems constituted of massive black holes. So objects with masses that will be between 100 and 1 million solar masses. So, this is for the principle, I mean, for, for, for the kind of idea of what we try to, uh, to detect. Um, gravitational wave, well, is a wave. Uh, in, and in that sense, uh, we can define a gravitational wave spectrum with different physics phenomena depending on the different uh, wavelengths we are trying to detect. So on this, uh, on this graph, on the on the right side, you have the fastest, you have the fastest uh, gravitational waves and highest frequency, and we are talking about frequencies that are basically at 100 or 1 kilohertz. So it's not extremely fast, but it's uh, fast for gravitational wave. So with events at the time scale of a millisecond or few milliseconds, and in this time range, we have uh, sources constituted of, for example, rotating neutron stars. So very, very massive stars uh, with some asymmetry. 
and uh, or, or, or supernovae or galactic uh, uh, white dwarf binaries in the um, in the galaxy in our galaxy and slightly beyond. These high frequency sources. So when we talk about high frequencies, basically you go a few hertz. These high frequency sources can be detected by uh, terrestrial interferometers, so like LIGO and Virgo on ground, uh, that are now, uh, of course, in line, and you probably have seen, it, uh, they have detected now a lot of gravitational wave sources on ground. But on ground, we will be limited, basically, at, at a few hertz by the noise uh, induced by Earth, that is, by the vibration and seismic noise of the Earth, or by gravitational fluctuation due to the movement of, uh, of yes, of, of rocks, let's say, in Earth. So, in order to get rid of uh, this perturbation and have access to a large, uh, to, to much more sources and uh, lower frequency range, then there is a project to send a space interferometer, which is named VISA, and which will have access to phenomena with time scales from seconds to hours, that is, frequencies between, let's say, a fraction of millihertz to, to hertz. And in that range, we will be able to detect, to measure the coalescence of uh, supermassive black holes that are at the center of galaxies. And we know that some of them are uh, orbiting one around each another. And we have two black holes, very massive black holes, orbiting and will virtually co um, coalesce and collapse and produce a lot of uh, gravitational waves that will allow us to, to know a lot of things about black holes and, and uh, fundamental physics and gravitation in general. And if you go even to lower frequencies, so with uh, a longer wave period, then you will reach with, peri with a period of at the scale of years for this wave, for this, um, for the gravitational wave. And then we, it will be able, we will be able to detect gravitational waves in that range by measuring the precise timing sent by pulsars and by correlating them uh, coming from different positions in the skies, and you can have an idea if there was some um, delay perturbations of this uh, pulsar's timing due to the path of the gravitational wave. I will not go further into the detail uh, on that. And at very, very low frequencies, that is basically with frequencies that are uh, equivalent to the age of the universe, uh, you can trace, I mean, the prospect is to trace the impact of gravitational waves on the polarization of cosmic microwave background, that is on the first light that was emitted 300,000 uh, years after the Big Bang, this light is polarized, and the way it is polarized is actually affected by, by gravitational waves uh, that happen just after the Big Bang. Okay, so in the following, I will basically focus on LISA, so that is on detecting gravitational waves using um, space interferometry uh, and uh, in the millihertz uh, regime. So, of course, I will not tell you uh, what is in uh, an interferometer, but just to illustrate that is it is particularly well suited to measuring the relative distance between two arms, and in that case, in our case, to measure the effect of a gravitational wave, which will stretch one, um, one arm in one direction and shrinks the other one uh, in the other direction. So it will give the uh, access to, uh, to the, to the um, optical pass length difference between the two arms, and which is actually proportional to the gravitational waves that we try to, to detect. And we will have to detect a fraction of the wavelengths. Typically, we are using lasers at one micron uh, wavelengths. And we will try to measure very, very tiny measurements because for LISA, for example, we try to measure a picometer level, that is, so a millionth of uh, the wavelengths of, uh, of the laser. So, on ground, uh, before going to space, so on ground there are now three operating uh, gravitational wave detectors based on 
Michelson interferometry. So two of them are in, uh, in the US, so one in Hanford, Washington, on the West Coast, and the other one in Livingston, in the Louisiana state, uh, so on the East Coast. Um, they, have, they are basically um, interferometers with arm lengths of four kilometers uh, long. So we have basically in the center, you probably recognize that the, that's where you have the laser source and the detectors. And at the end of this vacuum, ultra high vacuum tube, four kilometers long, you have um, suspended uh, folding uh, mirrors that will send back the, la the laser to, to, the, to the center and where we, we will measure the interferences. Uh, so, well, you need this kind of length to have the, the sensitivity and the, basically they reach a sensitivity in terms of length which is at the level of uh, one thousandth of the size of a proton, which is basically in time 10 to minus 18, 10 to minus 19 meter on ground. Uh, basically a similar uh, interferometer do exist um, in Europe. So it's named Virgo. It is near Pisa in Italy. It's um, mostly a French Italian cooperation with arm lengths of three kilometers long. Uh, but the principle of, I mean, the, the, the way it works is basically similar to, to, the, to, to the LIGO interferometers. And actually the hand for gravitational wave was quite long. It lasted a few years and uh, it ended, I mean, the search, let's say, ended in uh, September 14th, 2015. So, well, a bit more than four years ago, where in the detectors, in the LIGO detectors in Hanford and Livingston, they um, basically detected a, a chirp of, uh, of in, the amplitude of the, of the interference of the phase, of the, of the phase offset chirped uh, at uh, frequencies of uh, hundreds of Hertz with increase in, in amplitude at the end. And what you heard here, uh, was a coalescence of two uh, su of two black holes, each basically of a few tens of a uh, few, uh, yes, um, forty I think and fifty if I really remember solar masses each, which co which coalesced at uh, in a few milliseconds and produced um, more energy as during this short period of time than anything else any any other electromagnetic um, light produced by the whole universe. I mean, in this very short time, basically three solar masses of matter was converted into energy and produced gravitational waves. That was detected, so in September uh, 2015 by the two, these two interferometers. So since then we have now, uh, about, I think it's now about 30 detection of gravitational waves from a ground-based detector. Uh, mostly uh, gr black holes binaries, but also a few, uh, but also I think now two, uh, two detection for um, neutral star binaries. So basically that was now gravitational wave astronomy is beginning basically, and begins basically, it began basically f five years ago. And now we are preparing for uh, gr detecting gravitational wave, uh, waves from space. So from, this is a project named LISA, uh, uh, which, is, which has been selected as a large mission by ESA uh, in 2017. It is expected to be launched in 2034. However, the first studies for LISA, for a space-borne uh, detector, were conducted in the early 80s, actually the first studies we, we can find um, paper of, uh, were performed at the real, I mean, in 78, if I remember. So now LISA is on track, so we are good for, I mean, we think we will launch now, we have every, I mean, the space agency supporting this mission for launch in 2034, and we are currently in phases, that is in the preliminary define study phase for, for the mission. So 
So what is LISA? LISA is a giant interferometer with 2.5 million kilometer arm length orbiting the Earth. So you see here a sketch of the orbit of LISA. So you have three orbit, three satellites, each of them orbiting on, it, on its own uh, orbit. And these orbits are designed so that the uh, triangle uh, uh, formed by the three satellites is equilateral and is remaining roughly equilateral throughout the mission lifetime, that, which is at least four years and possibly ten. And this constellation of satellites is basically orbiting around the Sun, uh, about 20 degrees uh, behind the Earth. Uh, yes, so it will last for, for, for ten years, uh, hopefully. What should be uh, reminded here is that there is no active control of the satellite position and that we, uh, the satellites are basically, uh, the distance between satellites is fluctuating by about uh, 30,000 uh, kilometers over a year. So we have 2.5 million kilometers, but fluctuating by 30,000 kilometers uh, over a year. So it's an I mean, it's basically a constellation, but with no active uh, uh, control of the position of the spacecraft. That's important because we don't want to disturb the initial uh, state of the uh, of the spacecraft. We want it to be only driven by gravity and only gravity. So, how do we do that? Well, we have, as I said, three satellites in equilateral configuration, three arms, six six laser links. That forms basically three interferometers. Um, at this, in each uh, spacecraft, there are two initial test masses. Uh, what is a test masses? An initial test masses. It is a free-floating test mass that is illustrated here on the left. That is free-floating into uh, the cent in the center of the spacecraft, and the spe spacecraft is constantly recentering itself around this uh, this uh, this test mass and then it's in that way it's compensating for external disturbances such as the one produced by the uh, solar pressure basically the um, typical metrology that is uh, required in terms of noise level in the in the frequency range of lisa is at the level of about 10 picometer per root hertz at one millihertz. So for measurements of uh, for an interferometer that is 2.5 million kilometers long with propagation of light over 2.5 million kilometers. So if we go slightly more into the details of how a spacecraft is working, well, it's the principle is pretty uh, well, straightforward and the design, I mean, the external design looks quite simple. I mean, the, the deal is in the details, of course, but we have basically a payload constituted of three elements. One which is dedicated to sending and receiving the laser, that is obviously a telescope. So basically, uh, collimating uh, the laser. Uh, sent by, I mean, producing, produced on the optical bench and to receive the one that is emitted by the, by the other satellite. So basically there is about one watt of uh, infrared light sent from one satellite to another and about uh, 100 picowatt of light that is collected from the distant satellite. These uh, beams are recombined and uh, split in and etc on an optical bench, ultra stable zero dual optical bench here. That is actually also measuring the distance by interferometry always, measuring the distance between the, the, the optical bench and the test mass, the initial test mass that is hosted in this gravitational reference sensor. So by combining the measurement, the measured distance between the two satellites and the measured distance between the satellite and the test mass, then we can reconstruct very precisely the distance, I mean the fluctuation, I, I should say the fluctuation of the distance between one satellite, uh, one test mass and the other. And by comparing the uh, distances between two pair of satellites, 
then we can infer what is the amplitude of the gravitational wave passing by. So this is really a, a rough explanation of, of how LISA is working. Of course, there are a lot of technical details that I have no time to, to dig into, but uh, yeah, a lot of things to, to do on it. LISA is an ESA-led international collaboration with, you see, a lot of uh, collaborators. So mostly in Europe, but also with uh, uh, now uh, a, junior uh, a junior partnership with, with NASA, which is providing the, the telescope uh, and the, some part of the charge management system and, so, and, the laser sy and also the laser, the laser assembly. Um, and in Europe, Germany is a principal investigator, so, so it's managing the collaboration and France as a central role in integrating and testing the instrument, as well as a role uh, in developing the data processing center, the on-ground data processing, processing center. Before going directly to LISA, there was another mission which was named LISA Pathfinder, so which flew in 2015 and then ended in 2017. And it was basically a technology demonstrator for, uh, initial, uh, for initial flight and for drag-free flying, uh, that is basically the capability to, to fly around an initial mass. So LISA Pathfinder was basically a satellite with, um, I think it was about two meters in diameter here. And at the heart of the satellite, you have an, inter an interferometric bench, which is actually this one, ultra-stable interferometric bench, measuring the distance between two free-floating masses. And with this kind of, um, and, and based on the measurement of the, uh, of the distance, relative distance between the, sat the space, the, the, the test mass, the position of uh, the satellite was modified using micro thrusters, micro Newton thrusters. So basically, um, that was a demonstrator for the capability of inertial flying in space. Um, okay, I will go on to, I will not detail the, uh, the technical aspects, but basically we can, rem the objective was to measure at a picometer level the distance uh, between the two test masses. And when you go into space, of course, you have to deal with uh, some some disturbances that can be here expressed in terms of acceleration relative acceleration between the two test masses and as you see there is much more than just optical sensing not only optical is here basically perturbing the measurement we have of course the optical sensing which is dominated by the shot noise of the laser which is at a few femtometer uh, measure uh, in, in terms of distance, it's a few femtometer per root Earth's uh, noise. You have also what we call the Brownian noise, which is the impact, the residual impact of the, the, the impact of the residual atmosphere molecules that are still here be uh, impacting the, um, the test mass. That is, we are in vacuum, but there are still some molecules impacting the test mass and producing a few, a small recoil of the, of the test masses. You have some parasitic movement of the spacecraft. Basically, it will induce some Coriolis and inertial uh, effect in your measurement. You are not in an inertial reference frame to compute your, your measurement, in which case you have some I mean, deviation with respect to the uh, inertial computation. And if you go at very low frequencies and you have the temperature effects due to thermoelastic deformation of the benches and the uh, and, and the test mass housing. But finally, all this noise can be, I, I mean, most of the noise can be modeled and subtracted. And at the end, the, the residual noise that was achieved by ESA Pathfinder was extremely good. The objective was to have a noise level which was here, so in terms of in frequency and amplitude space, which was was here, so that is at a level of a few 10 to minus 14 
meter per square second per root earth, that is basically 10 to minus 13 of, um, of a J, of a gravitational uh, constant on ground. The LISA requirements were said to be uh, actually times times better. So we thought we could achieve LISA pass render and improve LISA pass render by, by an order of magnitude to reach the LISA requirements that was here. But actually, the results from LISA pass render were even below the LISA requirements. And we are now a margin in terms of initial test masses by three, by a factor of about three with respect to the most stringent LISA requirements. So it was a very, very good success. And you can see that we are reaching a few femtometer per second squared per router that is 10 to minus uh, 16 of, uh, of a J, which is extremely, extremely quiet in terms of relative acceleration. And if you translate that into what will be the impact on, on LISA, then, uh, well, you will be limited in frequency on LISA by at high frequency the fact that you have at some point more than one wavelength in the between two between two satellites, so it's penalizing basically the response, so it's going up again. In the middle range, so about all point, uh, around 10 millihertz, that will be the optimal sensitivity at about 30 picometer per root earth, basically driven by um, short noise and other thermal effects. And at very low frequencies, that is the, real, the residual acceleration of test masses that was what, this was uh, tested and demonstrated by Lisa Pathfinder. But at the end, you see, we reach sensitivities at 10 to minus uh, 20, uh, per root earth, that is, if you observe long enough, then you will reach uh, observation uh, sensitivity of 10 to minus 21 or 10 to minus 22 in terms of gravitational wave amplitude. And that will give access to, to a lot of uh, sources, basically all the supermassive source, uh, black holes, all the supermassive black holes coalescing in the uni universe, uh, I mean, around the mass of uh, one million solar masses, all the supermassive black holes of that mass coalescing in the universe should be detectable by LISA when it will be in orbit. There will be about 15,000 uh, galactic binaries that should be detectable by LISA. A few of them are already known in radio. There will be also uh, extreme mass ratio in spirals, a lot of, um, that is, binaries with a small and a big uh, black holes, black hole, while it that this kind of lines here. Um, solar, stera, also stera black, uh, binary black holes that might be uh, coalesce, I mean, detectable, that might be detectable by LISA, and so on. So, basically, compared to ground, uh, to ground detectors where Basically, the signal is uh, noise dominated. I mean, the, the effect is I mean, what we are measuring is noise dominating, dominated. In LISA, we are expecting to be source dominated, meaning that uh, we will have to fight against the superposition of sources, mostly, and not fighting against the noise level of the instrument when it will be in space. We are fighting. A, I mean, we have to design it properly, but. Once in space, if the sensitivity that we are planning is reached, then we will be, we will have many sources at the same time in the detector. So basically, all, all the lights are green now for LISA. We have demonstrated a lot of this uh, of the required technologies, and uh, we hope that we will pass the next reviews. We think we will, and uh, the launch of LISA is. Uh, expected in 2034, so in uh, 14 years from now. And uh, yeah, let's hope it, everything will go well for Lisa now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, very nice insight on this uh, challenging uh, project and very linked to fundamental physics. Um, so there are some questions from um, 
There's a question from, from Jean-François um, about the performances uh, of the Visa Pathfinder compared to the, the results obtained on the, on the Pathfinder compared to the expectations. Um, yeah. how, how to explain this, this very big ah. margin? Uh, Why is it so good? <laughs> Why is it so good? Uh, <laughs> Um, well, th there are different things. First is uh, when you build an instrument for the first time, you take margins everywhere because you don't know exactly what, you what to expect in space. So you take margins in terms of uh, thermal stability, in terms of uh, intrinsic stability of the optical bench, uh, in terms of uh, noise, of the, of the thruster noise, etc., of sensing noise also. And once you are in space, then you discover that actually you have uh, overestimated the, uh, the residuals, the noise residuals, and then you are able to dig into the noise and you have a, an environment that is much quieter than what was expected. So that basically is the, the reason for having a much better stability uh, in space. One has to think, one has to, to remember actually that this kind of performance cannot be measured on ground. On ground, when you try to sure. measure the stability of an optical bench, you are dominated by a lot of noises and you can just infer what, when you can just, I mean, try to infer what we will get in space, but uh, you will not uh, be able to test at this level of uh, accuracy on ground because of all the disturbances you will get in the lab. Mm -hmm. So basically, yes, it's much quieter up there than what we expected. Okay, that's clear. Okay, okay. Uh, so next, there's a question from Imran. Is uh, wondering how to do we achieve uh, the phase locking of all the lasers sources on the different satellites uh, to the reference laser on board because the satellites are very far away from each other. Yes. So how do we achieve the optical phase lock? Well, we have laser lights, which are uh, first so free running one with respect to, the, to another, but they are still reference to uh, ultra stable uh, reference cavity. So they are basically 50 megahertz from a common reference. So when we switch on the laser, they are all within 50 megahertz, but more or less from a known frequencies, from known frequencies. So, the first thing that will be done is to align the satellite one on each other. So it will be, I mean, directly by observing the amount of light that we get from the other satellite. So there is nothing about infrared there. It's just about, okay, observing the light from the other spacecraft. So we have a first phase of aligning the, the spacecraft and pointing a spacecraft to each other. And then there is a sweep in the frequency of one laser with respect to the other one. And at some point, the two frequencies will be close enough. They will produce a bit note that will be less than uh, about 20 megahertz. And in that case, we can measure a bit note on the photodiodes. We lock on this, uh, on this bit node. We basically force it to be, um, to be, let's say, as an example, 10 megahertz. And then we can force the local laser to be phase locked on the distant laser. And th then we can repeat this treatment on all the spacecraft and progressively you will lock uh, one laser uh, on the other ones. I mean, you will lock all the laser on, uh, on a single master one that will still be, uh, the master laser will be locked on, uh, on a trustable Fermi Perot cavity. So okay. basically that's pointing to each other and scanning frequencies until we get uh, a, a lock signal. Okay, and, and talking about these uh, frequencies and these lasers, what is the, the, the wavelength of the, the lasers? That, uh, uh, it's a it's a YAG laser, so it's one point oh sixty four nanometer uh, micrometer. Okay, okay, uh, and then then there's a, a last question from three two, I think. Okay, it's here. Um, so. If you have this uh, uh, very large uh, inter interferometer uh, with millions of kilometers between the, the satellites, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't it create it for data collection if space debris or some other uh, um, meteors or some, some other um, material go through the, the laser beam? 
Okay, so but the Sexual. beam is extremely large. I mean, okay. so we, we are talking a very very large beam. on the on the way from one satellite to another. Actually, well, I can probably start with the fact that space is really empty when we see that there is a uh, sure. there is something that can go through the 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 beam. I mean, the probability is very low, uh, especially that uh, well we are far from Earth. Uh, we are far from being on any st stable position for asteroids or anything, so it's very empty. What we have mostly is that dust in this in this area, I mean, around the the ecliptic plane. But even the dust is very, um, I mean, very with very low density, and it has no effect at all on the, on the laser. Uh, and if there is really no chance that if there is one object crossing the the light close enough to a to a satellite that it will basically block the light for for a few for a few seconds, and we will be very unlucky, or maybe very lucky to you. Uh, and uh, well, we can just resume the acquisition a few seconds later, so mm -hmm. there is no no real impact. We also started to have a look at what is the impact in terms of gravitation. Of having um, an asteroid going uh, coming nearby a satellite, I mean not impacting, but just to what level we can have an asteroid going close to a satellite and uh, having a gravitational effect that can mimic a gravitational wave. Actually, that's negligible. We have probabilities, okay. but still, we, that's the kind of thing we can care. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So, and there's the. Maybe the, the last question from Lena, uh, asking what is the actual mass of the reference mass? It's, uh, it's five, uh, no, it's three kilograms. I've always uh, missed it. Okay, it's about three kilograms. It's a five centimeters uh, cube uh, made of platinum and gold, platinum and gold, and it uh, weighed about uh, three kilograms. It's pretty massive. 